Spirit of God, we pray that you move in and through these ancient words that they may become your living word and enable us to hear them and then become your living witnesses. To this end, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of each one of our hearts be acceptable in your sight. O God, our rock and our redeemer. So we're actually reading, uh, still from Matthew's Gospel, the 23rd chapter, verses 1 through 12. Let us listen to what the Spirit may be speaking to the church. Then Jesus said to the crowds and to his disciples, The scribes and the Pharisees sit on Moses' seat. Therefore they do whatever they teach. Therefore do whatever they teach you and follow it. But do not do as they do, for they do not practice what they teach. They tie up heavy burdens, hard to bear, and lay them on the shoulders of others, but they themselves are unwilling to lift a finger to move them. They do all their deeds to be seen by others, for they make the phylacteries broad and the fringes long, and they love the place of honors at banquets and the best seats in the synagogues, and to be greeted with respect in the marketplaces, but, and, and, to, and to have people call them rabbi. But you are not to be called rabbi, for you have one teacher, and you are all students. And call no one your father on earth, for you have one father, the one in heaven. Nor are you to be called instructors, for you have one instructor, the Messiah. The greatest among you will be your servant, and all who exalt themselves will be humbled, and all who humble themselves will be exalted. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. It is always necessary to remind us that when we hear these words from Jesus, it is not a polemic against Jewish people. It is, in fact, the truth that is as Karl Barth once said, in Nazi Germany, they got him thrown out. When he preached a sermon, Jesus was a Jew. This was an in-house conversation, a frustration with the very people that he hoped would know that God's justice and love is at the heart of our faith, not more rules about the way things are supposed to be. These words are a call for us to figure out how to live with more authenticity, where our actions and our beliefs are in harmony. About a year ago, there was an article in The Guardian by Dean Burnett. A really fascinating one, and I want to share with you some of those details. The title of the article is this. It's only wrong when you do it. The psychology of hypocrisy. Hypocrisy is a funny thing, but one of the things in that article that made it clear is it is not clear cut. We like to think that it was, but some of the things that they reveal in this article through cognitive science and study, frankly, surprised me in some ways. This may not come as a surprise, though, that our reaction to hypocrisy is not uniform. We tend to overlook the simple cases, the things that are really of not great notes. But when a politician for example, who condemns abortion, believes he is pro-life, but then forces his mistress to have an abortion, people have a pretty strong reaction to that. However, what we also know, and I've heard from some of you recently, how is it that our brothers and sisters don't get upset when X, Y, and Z do or don't do this? The truth is some people will give politicians and others a pass for all sorts of things that they won't give to others. We see this all the time and we wonder, and it turns out that we often will give a pass to people who hold our worldview. They're on our team, so who cares what he's grabbing? The truth is we are far more wired naturally to point out hypocrisy when it goes against our own personal beliefs. Or it is done by those with whom we disagree with. 
We are way better at pointing out hypocrisy in others than we are in ourselves. In fact, we are wired not to see it in ourselves. This is where Jesus then talks about the issue of gnats and camels, right? We have this horrible time swallowing these small things, but when it comes to camels, we'll swallow that whole. We know now that cognitively we are wired to tell ourselves lies based on our biases, about our biases, and about our own abilities. Apparently we're good at thinking better of ourselves than we actually are. We are really good at believing that ultimately we're good and decent people, even when our hand is on the executioner's blade. But here comes the rub. We are actually much more realistic when it comes to pointing out hypocrisy in others. We can see the faults that they cannot, or that they choose to live with. This is why I think it's good to have a friend or two who can really be honest with you, to tell you what you do not want to hear, because we cannot see it sometimes in ourselves. The article goes on to say how complex the issue is and then ask, why is it that we do it? Why is it that we are all hypocrites? And here's the answer. Because it takes work to change. And that was where the article came down. And we as human beings will always choose the path of least resistance. It's just about being lazy because, gosh, it's hard not to be a hypocrite. However, the good news in the article was that they found that when others pointed out hypocrisy in others, that it often led to change. In other words, what they were talking about is that accountability mattered. Having people around who might be able, instead of just confirming our own bias, I know we all have those folks we go to when we want them to con just confirm what we already know, but then the other folks who can point out what we do not see. Which is why when Jesus calls out the religious leadership, he's not just beating them up. He's really calling them to repentance and reminding the hearers. It's not the Pharisees and the scribes he's talking to, right? He's talking to those who would seek to follow him to remind them that they too can fall into this trap. We all can fall into this trap. He's not interested in simply embarrassing the scribes and Pharisees. It's easy, I think, for us to look back and see that and think that's what he's doing because that's what we're surrounded with all the time. Let's score points for our side. Jesus is not interested in scoring political points with his followers. He's actually hoping for transformation for those who are part of the very unjust system. So what is the issue with the scribes and Pharisees going on in this text? The truth is they have come to love attention and privilege that comes with their position. Now, one of the things written into our human fabric is the fact that we seek out feedback from other people. We need to know what others think that, in some ways, sort of keep us in check. Not in a horrible way, but just so that you're not out, I don't know, stealing and causing trouble when you shouldn't be. But that human desire for affirmation from others can lead to all sorts of narcissism. It can lead to being blinded and only listened to. I, Got to speak to a political consultant all that long ago about uh, someone who I had respected who had retired years ago. He was a politician in Indiana. And I asked, well, you knew him, what happened at the end of his career? And he said, well, the problem was is he began to believe what they were saying about him. And it was all good. The problem with the scribes and Pharisees is that they had come to love the attention and believe the things people said to their face, but ignored what was being said behind their back. And the privilege that they, have, that they received from their position, they had come to love the comforts. They had made peace with it. But how did it come to this is the question I believe we have to ask. 
so that we don't fall into that same trap. How did the faith, right, that was built on justice for all, equity of land distribution, I'm talking about the very fabric of the covenant at Sinai, how did it, the faith that created protections for those most vulnerable in society, and welcomed the immigrant, and rejecting the ways of empire, become reduced to what it had by the time of Jesus, which was to ignore political corruption and get some pieces of the pie in the process. How did that faith lead to massive inequality at the time of Jesus and starvation of the population and turning people landless and homeless? Allowing for those things, but when it came to religious practice, that was so difficult that it excluded the very people who were living under the thumb of oppression. And then they blamed them for their own suffering. Sound familiar? The empire won out in the faith, and Jesus is saying we cannot have it both ways. You can't focus on religious ritual and ignore the poor. You cannot take communion one day and go cut 50,000 jobs the next day and think God's good with that. Mary Jean Bowler, retired Presbyterian pastor, former pastor at Second Presbyterian Church and colleague of mine. The first time I saw her preach and do communion, she said, what we do at this table matters when you go and sit on a corporate board somewhere else, friends. And I thought, wow, seconds in for some fun. But she's right. Because it's tied together. Yes, we are all wired for hypocrisy, but it is not enough for us to say, well, we're all hypocrites, we'll move on. Mm -hmm. That is an abdication of our power. And this is what Jesus is pointing out. What Jesus has been speaking about. And Jesus is doing this not to simply point it out. It is not enough to simply point out hypocrisy and to point out what our opponents are doing wrong, but to look for places of transformation and liberation for those who are suffering under that hypocrisy. That's what Jesus is calling us to do. That is the hard part, by the way, but it is the calling. Pointing it out, seeing it for what it is, is the first step, but not the last. And knowing that we will always fall down. But we have to try anyway. Jesus sees that when hypocrisy then is tied to privilege, that a great evil can be done by those who believe that they are essentially good and decent people. So what do we take from all this? I suppose one is that we should never be surprised with the capacity of other people and ourselves to live with our own lies. And to recognize that we have the capacity to be the biggest liar in the bunch. And that's where we seek humility. And then to never give up hope this is a hard one these days, right? That transformation and liberation is possible even for those with whom we do not share a worldview. Some of you might remember that there was a senator from one of our western states who was caught doing something in what we would consider outside the bounds of his marriage with someone in a bathroom in an airport. And I will not forget the outcry at the time from some of my liberal religious friends about his hypocrisy. We do this often, right? And then I went to a conference that next week, and my preaching professor happened to be speaking, and she got up and said, we as people, and it was a conference that was seeking the inclusion of gay and lesbian folk in life of the Presbyterian Church. It tells you how long ago it was. And she said, we are the people who should reach out to him and lift him up and not beat him up, because we understand grace. That's tough. That's the tough part. That's the tough part. It is possible that transformation can come 
But make no mistake, it doesn't always, for us or for others. But do not become despairing when the day does not come fast enough, or even in our lifetime. It is not beyond God's power to turn those running the empires of the world into the followers of Jesus. Even though we haven't seen it yet. And this passage shows what cognitive science has taught us. That one of the benefits of our faith is the faith community, the gathered community. That we need a few good folks in our lives or a few other hypocrites who can see our faults and we can see theirs. Who can be honest with us in a loving way. Sometimes loving is hard. But being honest, we are called to do that. People who can remind us that we might be lying to ourselves. And then to show us the grace to encourage us to live less like hypocrites and more into the vision that God has given us. For ourselves and for this community. That we might indeed believe that it is possible that all people are God's beloved children. All of us are fearfully and wonderfully made. And we are all prone to be hypocrites. But we are not left to our own devices. And we are called to recognize and to see and to be open to being pointed out in our own lives. May God give us the grace to admit when we have fallen down and the trust that it is not the end of the story. Amen.